Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our second lecture, our second content-based lecture of the course. Um, this week we have quite a bit of information to cover, as you probably noticed in the reading assignment. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Um, in a way, though, those readings, uh, all of those chapters in the textbook, are, I hope, pretty straightforward, and you can look forward to a little bit of a break next week. So don't think that that's gonna happen every single week. Uh, in any case, um, one of the reasons we have to cover so much at the beginning of the quarter is so that we can get these basic ideas down um, and use those, apply those to world art over the rest of the quarter. So what we're doing this week um, is we're going to really start using a lot of art historical terminology, um, learn what the concepts are behind these terms, and then introduce uh, you to the major formal elements of visual art. The formal elements of a visual art are its building blocks. So a painting, for instance, or a drawing is made up of things like line, and shapes and sometimes colors and form and space and so forth. So um, one of the reasons we want to talk about the formal elements independently of what they represent. So for instance, here you're looking at a work by M.C. Escher that uh, shows the illusion that drawing can achieve, right? Two hands popping out of a, a flat piece of paper. One of the reasons we want to talk about the formal elements of a work of art independent of just what they represent. So instead of just talking about hands, we want to talk about, for instance, shading and light and the use of line and so forth, is that what we'll be doing a lot of over the course of the quarter is analyzing works of art. And to analyze something means to break it down into its component parts um, and, and think about how these component parts are affecting us. So if a line is long and continuous, it will have a different effect on us than if a line is short and choppy and so on and so forth. And if we look at the way that these visual languages work, the way that they're telling the story, communicating their message, the effects that they have independently, then we can break everything down into independent parts, talk about what kind of effects those are having, and then look at like we're making a long sheet of, okay, lines doing this and colors doing this and spaces doing this, you can see the types of effects they are and say, how are those effects of the form elements modifying or changing or telling the story in a very particular way? But before we even get to that, what we wanna do is get some basic kind of concepts under our belt and introduce you to some major terms. Now, what I'm gonna do is take what I think are the most important aspects of the chapters that you'll be reading and really focus on those. And I'm going to give you examples, some of which are already in your textbook and others which are different examples. And I'm gonna to try to really flesh out what the textbook is talking about concerning these, these, these aspects of that reading that I find most important. So I'm not gonna to try to cover everything that's in that reading, that would be redundant. But what I really wanna do is place some emphasis and explain further what I think are the most important ideas and terms and concepts that are in those chapters that you've been assigned. So one of the first things that I'd like to talk about is the way that all of the works of art that we're looking at in this class in some way or another are what we call representations. They represent the world in a new way. And that's what I was just kind of referring to. So for instance here, uh, before I go into the details, this is a famous work that's in your text that was painted by a Belgian artist by the name of René Magritte. He was a surrealist painter. And this one is called The Treason of Images, or sometimes called The Treachery of Images from the late 1920s. And he painted this over and over again. What you get is what we might call a very realistic depiction of a pipe, right? Later on, you'll learn that this could be talked of as realistic or photorealistic. And it looks really illusionistically real. And we know it's painting, but it's really well done. And then down beneath it, in French, it says, this is not a pipe. Now, when you first read that, you're like, wait a minute, this is obviously a pipe, right? It, it is a pipe, except what he's trying to do is say, it's not a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe, a re-presentation of a pipe in the form of painting. 
And that painting has its own qualities. It's going to be understood differently than if you came in contact with a real pipe. And what he's really getting at is the way that images mean something. And that's our first topic for the day. How do visual signs mean what they do? And to learn a little bit more about that, we're going to take a detour through something that's not a part of your textbook, but it is something that I've always found is really useful to think about how meaning, whether it be meaning in art or meaning in any kind of visual or written language really happens, right? We don't think about this a lot, but if you stop and kind of start thinking, wait a minute, why does something mean what it means? Um, you know, you want to know how these things operate. And the study of how signs, anything that has meaning, in other words, mean what they do is referred to as semiotics or semiotic theory. What you see on the screen in front of you then is on the right hand side a diagram that divides a sign or anything that has meaning into two parts, a signifier and a signified. Now there are various different kinds of signs and again by a sign I could mean a word, I could mean an image, I could mean a, a literal street sign, it could be a symbol, anything that has meaning. So let's start with the first type of sign and I'll explain why they divide a sign into a signifier and a signified. The first kind of sign is a linguistic sign or a conventional sign. This is a word for instance and when you have a word, the relationship between the word itself and what it is supposed to mean is a matter of convention. That means you have to learn it, right? So an example of this is let's use the word apple. So the word apple, if I speak it out loud, that sound that you hear is the signifier. Now, when I say it, or when you read the word A-P-P-L-E, the resultant mental image you get in your head, you might think of this as a concept, but it's really just the mental image you get when you hear or read the word apple is what we call a signified. Now the two together are the sign, the conveyed meaning of the term apple. But let's go back to signify or signified again. So I say apple, or I write out the word apple and you read it. The resultant mental image you get in your head, apple, is the signified, right? Why did I break those into two parts? What's to be gained by making this more complicated? Well, what's to be gained is to think about what the relationship is between a written or spoken sign like apple and its meaning or the concept that occurs in your head. And in the case of a linguistic sign, so a word or a conventional sign, a symbol can be a linguistic sign. The conveyed meaning of apple and that connection between the signifier and signified is totally a matter of convention. You have to have learned it. There's nothing innately or naturally connecting together either the word A-P-P-L-E or the sound apple to that fruit that we all know it refers to. It's just a matter of convention. And it's easy to test this, right? If you know a foreign language, you'll know that, for instance, in French, the word for apple is pomme. Doesn't sound anything like apple in English. It's just a matter of convention that connects these things together. What we gain from knowing this about linguistic or conventional signs is knowing that some meanings, we have to just know what the meaning is. And this is true of a lot of different symbols in particular. Think of the peace sign, for instance, right? A peace sign, there's nothing innately about the peace sign that means peace. We have to have learned that. And each sign is culturally specific. So if we go to one culture, a sign might be quite different than another culture. If you've traveled in foreign countries and you've seen signs that are meant to alert you or warn you to this and that, and they look totally different than what we have in the United States, and it takes you a minute to figure them out, it's because it's a matter of a convention. Now let me add one more component to this. There's another term in semiotics that is what we call a referent. So the sign apple, either written or heard, um, represents an actual apple. Now what that sign actually refers to out in the real world is what we call its reference. So if I say something like, this morning I ate an apple for breakfast, breakfast, the sign apple refers to 
the actual apple I ate this morning for breakfast. That apple that I ate for breakfast is what we call a referent. Or if I say this glass of water here that I'm going to drink um, is very cold, the water, that word, is the sign this glass is the referent. That sign, the word water, represents this thing. Now again, why do I care about all this? So we can think about how meaning occurs and it becomes more kind of understandable when we make this a bit more complex. So let's talk about a different kind of sign, what's called an iconic sign, which is a type of sign where the connection between the signifier and the signified is at least partially based upon resemblance. So for instance, the icons on your phone or your laptop oftentimes look like what they're meant to represent. If you're searching for, you know, how to print something, you see a little, you know, a schematic that looks like a printer, you're like, oh, that's what I, that's the tab that I push because it looks like what it is meant to mean, what it's meant to represent, what it refers to. So let's look at this symbol that I put in front of us here. Here, the cigarette is an iconic sign, meaning when you look at that, you're going to think, okay, probably a cigarette. Let's face it, it could be something else, but it looks enough like a cigarette that we can say, ah, cigarette, right? It resembles the thing that it represents. Thus, it is an iconic sign. Icon literally means picture. It's a picture of what it represents. However, the circle with the slash through it, the red circle with the slash through it, is not iconic at all. Even though it is an image, there's nothing about a circle with a red slash that intrinsically or naturally means not allowed or prohibited, right? We have to have learned that, thus making the circle with the red slash a conventional or linguistic sign. Finally, there's another type of sign where the connection between the, um, the signifier and its signified is much more direct. And this is the type of sign that we call an indexical sign or an index. In this case, you're looking at the footprint of the first step on the moon. The sign, meaning this footprint, has an existential link between the signifier and the signified, and further between the sign that someone stepped here and what it refers to, a foot stepped here. Fingerprints, shadows, forensic traces, like if you like forensic cop shows, forensics in general, it's often theorized are, uh, as well as photographs, are at base a kind of indexical sign. Now, in a lot of cases, it's more complex than that. Like, for instance, here we have an indexical sign that was created by someone stepping here. You can imagine an indexical sign, someone putting a handprint on a window, someone actually put their hand there. It's a sign that someone touched that. It's a sign that someone stepped there. But oftentimes, what these things are tent, you know, thought to mean, like, oh my God, human achievement, we've got to the moon. That's not what it's an indexical sign of. All it's an indexical sign of is someone stepped here, someone did something. And in a lot of cases, art has indexical signs here. The art was created in a very particular way according to a very particular process. And that process, let's say, dripping uh, paint on a canvas or um, you know, in cave paintings, which we'll see right off, someone blows um, basically charcoal, uh, pigment around their hand to to connect to the, the, the kind of spiritual uh, essence of the cave, those are indexical marks that can give you a sense of what that art was supposed to be about. This is meant to make you think further about how meaning occurs in works of art. The one thing that isn't uh, included in this discussion of semiotics is that a lot of people believe that the formal elements of art have a phenomenological effect on us, so that color impacts us in a very particular and almost um, a you know, predictable way, that warm colors affect us one way and cool colors affect us another way, so that the formal elements themselves are seen to have a kind of expressive um, meaning to them, but we'll get to that in due time. So what do we get from all of this? Well, this is another work by Rene Magritte, in this case, not included in your textbook. 
that's called the human condition. And if you can't quite read this yet, what you're looking at is a painting that is still sitting on its easel in front of a window. And only this, if you follow my cursor here, this little side here where you can see the stretched canvas and the staples or nails that hold it, hold it there, betrays the fact that there's any difference between the canvas and what it represents. But neither, nevertheless, what is being said to us here in this work titled The Human Condition is that our understanding of the world, meaning itself, is a process of representation. We sense the world, right? We experience the world. But when we give it meaning, when we communicate to each other and to ourselves about what that's all about, we turn our experience and our sensate information into words, into concepts. And those concepts are representations of the world outside of us. Artists for ages have been wondering about our connections to the world and putting these wonderings into art forms that are representations. So following kind of the order of the textbook, let's test this a little bit, right? Think a little bit about this work in front of you. It's a work by Shireen Nashat, who is an Iranian-born ar artist who works out of New York. This was a work called Rebellious Silence that came from a series called the Women of, Women of Allah series by this artist. Um, and it was inspired by a very devout uh, Islamic woman poet who writes in Farsi about the status of women under uh, Islam and what some of the things mean. Now, when we first look at this, many of us may not know what all of this means. Like, I would presume that most of us don't read Farsi, right? So we can't read the words that have been written on this photograph. We don't know that this is a poem uh, by Terera uh, Farzetti or Terzetti about uh, the status of women in Islam. We may not know what it is that this woman is wearing. It's a shador, uh, which is a covering that covers everything but the face and the hands of women. And we may not know what that means. We may not know why she's got a gun in front of her. As a matter of fact, the artist has set this up so as to test our prejudices. We may look at this and know nothing about it other than it's other than what we know assigned to it meanings that we have come across in, let's say, the media or in our lives or talking to friends. We may look at this and because there's so much talk about Islam and terrorism, assume this is a terrorist and this is, you know, somehow related to that. Now what she's doing is testing us because here, one of the things that she's trying to make us recognize is that we don't know. And when we don't know, we supply our own narratives or meanings to things. Like we don't know, and we oftentimes hear that the shador or the hijab or any number of head coverings, um, you know, uh, are imposed upon women. And in some cases, perhaps they are, but in many other cases, women, of course, voluntarily adopt this clothing to show their uh, devoutness to Islam. It is a way for them to hide uh, things that are seen as beautiful by men and thus attain some kind of status as not being a sexual object for men. Um, the whole Farsi script on her face as well is there because it refers to the tradition of Islam in which writing is one of the fund fundamental art forms. In Islam, imagery is one of those things that is oftentimes forbidden. The depiction of the human face in many uh, traditions of Islam is not something that is allowed to be represented. Now, she may also be uh, referring with the gun in front of her uh, to the fact that many women are militant about Islam or many are talked into doing you know, horrible things in the name of Islam. But before we know the rest of the story, um, we're probably not going to be very sympathetic to that. So what I'm getting at here is that the meaning that occurs in this work is in part a part of conventions, conventions that we in the West may or may not be particularly aware of. But to understand cultural others, we would certainly have to be aware that their traditions and their conventions are quite different than ours, and it will take some work to understand what those are. We shouldn't just follow our prejudices. 
Another work that is on the same subject, but I'm not going to go into in great detail, is this work by Lorna Simpson called Female. In this case, you see four basically similar, it's the same person we believe, photographs uh, of someone who is dressed in a way that is, let's say, by conventional standards, ambivalent. Is this a man? Is this a woman? How could you tell? Only by the captioning or the title where this thing is called female does it become female, per se. It makes us think some about the cultural conventions that we live by, certain types of clothing, wearing makeup or not wearing makeup, wearing skirts, wearing high heels, wearing suits, and so forth, are gendered. And if someone crosses those genders, what does it mean, right? Conventional languages. Now let's uh, add a few more terms that will be used throughout this quarter. The first set of terms that I want you to be thinking about is representational versus abstract or non-objective forms of representation. You probably know what this means. Representational art, generally speaking, is the art that you recognize. You look at it and say, ah, that's a mountain, or oh, that's a human being. Whereas abstract art or non-objective art is art that tends to be about um, things that aren't recognizable, shapes and forms and colors and things that may or may not represent anything else. There are various forms of representational art, naturalistic, realistic, photorealistic, and idealistic. Naturalistic are forms of art that look like something like let's say a mountain or a person, but they're not based upon an actual mountain or person, or rather the artist has changed them so much that they aren't an accurate or realistic representation of a particular person or a particular mountain. Another way to put this is they look quite realistic, but they may or may not be based upon very accurately a real person. Now, naturalistic is a fairly general term, and for the most part, most works of art are naturalistic and not realistic. Realistic works of art are works of art that are meant to, as accurately as possible, represent whatever their subject matter is. Now, the subject matter is a human, a mountain, a tree, can be even more specific, a particular person like Napoleon or Jesus or the Virgin Mary or Buddha or what have you. And if they're meant to accurately represent the person, they're realistic. Photorealistic is just an extra degree of realism. It looks like a photograph. The artist is really trying to make that look like a photograph, but it's not. It's a painting or something. Now, idealistic is very closely related to the idea of naturalistic. It just has this added thing to it. Idealism means that you take something like, let's say, a picture of Napoleon, which we saw in last week, that portrait and you make him look better than he actually looks. You, in choosing to make him look better, you think about what society values as better, like more beautiful, wider, bigger eyes, or you know, very clear complexion, or whatever it might be, and you submit your subject matter to that idealism, right? And we call that idealistic. Now, these last three terms here, subject matter, form, or formal elements, and content, are meant to alert you to something. The subject matter of a work of art is what it is at its base level. It's a crucifixion. It's a, uh, it's a scene of an athletic hero. It's a scene of a pharaoh. It's a scene of a sphinx, whatever it is, whatever it represents. The form, or the formal elements, is analyzing how that subject matter is represented. What choice did the artist uh, make when it came to the use of line or the use of color or how to you know, include this figure with other figures, its composition and so forth? And again, remember what we're thinking about here. I could represent the same subject like we saw last week, the crucifixion, in a lot of different ways. So what makes them different is the artist's choice of which formal elements to include. Subject matter and form plus what we know about a context, and plus what we know about things like the symbols employed, those all add up to what we call the work's content. The content of a work of art is really just its meaning. And there is not just one meaning to a work of art, I should say. There are multiple different possibilities for meaning. Um, 
the meaning that the artist thought that the work would have, the meaning that various viewers during that artist's own time period would have thought the work of art had, the meaning that these works of art now have in museums for experts in the field, and frankly, the meaning that we think that these works of art have. Now, art's not completely radically relative. Not every meaning is particularly compelling, but there is some variance in meaning. They're like poems, right? And poems, I think we can read them and say, oh, it's probably about this, but there's lots of variation within that, that you know, area that these things might be about. So let's take an example of this. This is a work by Albert Bierstadt, who was a German-born artist who came to the United States in his late teens and was the first, one of the first artists to travel past the Mississippi and bring back, uh, or rather, um, bring back sketches and then turn them into these giant paintings of what he was seeing. This is happening before photography is particularly viable. Um, photographs were around at this point, but they came in really small sizes and they're black and white. Um, so these were, you know, the pictures that people saw of the, of the time. Um, and I just want to employ some terms here. This one's called Rocky Mountains Landers Peak, uh, after that peak in the center of this, uh, right here. Right? So what you're looking at in terms of subject matter is a mountain and a lake with a waterfall, some trees, and a Shoshone encampment, Native Americans in the foreground, grass, and so forth, right? As a genre of painting, the type of painting it is, this is a landscape painting. It is clearly a representational painting, right? We can tell what it is. It's not an abstract painting. Now, the question is, what kind of representational painting is it? Is it realistic? Is it naturalistic? Is it photorealistic? Or is it idealistic? Well, it's absolutely naturalistic. Nothing ever looked like this exactly. We know this for sure because we can go to the actual spot that he would have supposedly painted this from and we're able to see, no, it's not accurate. The big inaccuracy is that this peak up here looks suspiciously like the Matterhorn in Germany, which was the most famous mountain at the time. And Albert Bierstadt, knowing that no one would ever see Landers Peak, at least not while he was alive, likely, painted it to look like the Matterhorn because that was, you know, a famous peak. Now, the other question, though, is, is it idealistic? And yes, in a way, it is idealistic. He's trying to make this look like an earthly paradise, better than it actually looked. But frankly, most of the time, we save the term idealistic for the representation of humans, Anyway, you could use both and I'd be fine with it, either idealistic or naturalistic. Let's see. Now, how about this one? Fawn Kwan's Travelers Amidst Mountains and Streams. A um, little bit earlier painting by almost a thousand years, a Chinese landscape painting done in ink. Um, is this realistic? Is this naturalistic? Is it idealistic? Is it photorealistic? Now you would immediately think you know, wouldn't you? You'd say, wait a minute, it doesn't, it can't possibly look like a real place. But here's the trick. We need to know the cult cultural conventions of the time. Did people at this time think this looked like a real place? And the thing is, we know from evidence of people writing about this that it was meant to look accurate. Now, is it an actual representation of a particular place? We know that it's not. So again, this is either naturalistic or idealistic, taking nature and making it look a little bit better. It's also probably filled, as was the earlier painting by Bierstadt, with a lot of symbolism, but we'll save that for the course of the quarter. My point here is to say that don't immediately think you know, especially if something was produced in another culture or thousands of years ago, whether the artist intended something to be naturalistic or realistic or abstract. This might appear to most of us as being on the scale of being more abstract than realistic, but for the artists of the time, it was thought of as naturalistic. Now this one is pretty straightforward, right? This is Kazmir Malevich. Um, who was a 20th century painter from Russia, and the work here is called The Suprematist Painting. Now, is this representational? Well, here's the thing. At some level, 
you could say it's representational, right? It's a representation of a triangle and a uh, rectangle, but he's not trying to represent triangles and repre uh, represent rectangles. What he's trying to do is represent abstract forms that have some kind of impact on us. So we would call this work abstract or non-representational, right? It's supposed to be a combination of forms and colors and space in such a way that makes us think about something or feel something or just be pleased by these beautiful arrangements of form abstract or non-objective types of painting. Now, finally, I want to say that along with all of this, you know, this conventional signs that we've been talking about and so forth, uh, you know, works of art are filled with what we call symbols or iconography. Iconography literally means picture writing. And remember last week how we said this work is filled with symbols, right? Symbols everywhere. Well, how would you know that a dog means fidelity? You have to learn it. But then once you've learned it and you see a dog in works of art of the West, you're going to think, oh, this is about fidelity or loyalty. When you see a single candle lit, you're going to think, oh, something legal or holy is happening. When you see a mirror, you're going to think, oh, God is witnessing this. And those symbols, once you learn them, remain the same. Now, again, is this a representational peer painting? Absolutely. Has it been idealized? Well, it's, it's not clear. If we had a photograph of these people, we'd probably know better if they're being made to look better. Is it naturalistic? Probably, right? It's probably not realistic. He's probably trying to make it look like a scene, but not exactly the way that it looked. So then let me pause for a minute uh, and I'll be right back here. Excuse me. So let's go back, go on to the next part of today's lecture. Those are just some basic ideas about how you might think of meaning occurring in works of art, some key terminology that we'll use a lot and now we're going to learn, uh, learn a little bit about what are called the formal elements of art. Now, formal elements mean elements of the form of a work of art. Every once in a while, you'll hear these referred to as the vil visual elements of works of art. And we're going to just work our way through these kind of systematically. It's about building a shared terminology uh, so that we can analyze works of art or break them down into their constituent parts. And it's also about something else that's really important here. We always want to break these elements down, right? To say, hey, here's line in this work of art. Here's the type of line being used. But even more importantly, we want to do that so that we can ask what kind of effect might this type of line or this quality of line be having on me. And that's where I'm going with this. So first of all, let's start with a kind of basic element of just about all art in just about every kind of visual representation and that's line right we all know what line is line is basically a two-dimensional thing it runs you know it's well we know what line is it's easier to look at than to explain isn't it there are different types of line and pay attention to this because a type of line is different than a quality of line Types are designations or definitions. Whenever you hear an art historian or a critic start talking about the quality of a formal element, what they're really saying is what type of effect might this particular use of line or color or whatever it might be have on us. So again, the first type of line is an outline. We all know what this is. An outline is just the exterior of an object, right? But it's a little bit tricky. An outline, when art historians use this, refers to something that's completely two-dimensional, right? It doesn't refer to three dimensions at all, like this apple that we see here on the screen in front of me. It looks like an apple, right? It's all two-dimensional, though. Nothing else to it. Now, if I'm going to refer back to our earlier um, discussion of semiotics, I could say, it's a line drawing, an outline drawing of an apple, and as such, it's an iconic sign of an apple, right? Looks like that thing. It's an outline, just two-dimensional. The second kind of line, though, is what we call a contour line. And a contour line 
is a line that describes three dimensions. So in this case, you have a work by Henri Gaudier Bresca called Reclining Nude from around 1912, in which you can see how the artist has done an outline in some cases, but then he's added extra elements here to give it a little bit more dimensionality, particularly in the feet. So a contour line is something that is like an outline, but it has more information and starts to describe three dimensions. And when we see that, when we see those three dimensions, we realize that um, we are looking at a contour line, right? Oh, it's going to do this thing again. Funny, isn't it? Excuse me while I pause again here. Okay, sorry about that. I think I got us back on track, hopefully. So again, contour line, right? Just starting to describe three dimensions, but very much like an outline. Now, it's not only drawings or paintings or two-dimensional art forms that have contours or outlines. Um, sculptures also have them. Buildings have them. The contour is just the external component of a, in this case, a figure. This is a work by Giacometti. Um, that is called man pointing. And if you were to look at the outline of this figure or its contour line, you can see that it's got its own contour, don't you? Now, again, we want to be thinking very carefully, not just about what these terms designate. We want to think about what effect they have on us. So if I go back here and I say, hey, these contour lines are long and continuous. They move, you know, you can go right along them follow my cursor, and they don't break. They're not little short, jagged things. They're long, continuous lines. These long, continuous, curving lines have a particular effect on this that's generally soothing. You can basically think of it this way. Long, continuous lines take less work for our eye to take in. And anything that takes less work for us is going to be more calming, more soothing. Things that take a lot of work, like lines that move around quite a bit, lines that are short and jagged or not continuous, they start and stop, start and stop, take a lot of work for our eye to deal with, they tend to be more energizing. And that's a rule of thumb you can apply to just about all the formal elements, right? Something that your eye can take in all at once is easier on us and tends to be more ordered, calming, easy, frankly rational. Things that take a lot of work, short choppy lines, uh, you know, very harsh textures, very bold, intense colors, and so forth, they tend to energize us more, add more energy to whatever they represent. So when you look at this human figure, what we're getting at is the contour lines here being long and soothing, that's their quality or their effect, make this figure in repose, leaning back, seem like she's relaxed, right? Then we look at Giacometti's work, and if you were able to see this up close, or up closer, in fact, I will get us in up closer here for a minute, you'll see that the contours here are short and jagged and have tons of texture to them, don't they? And our eye running up that is going to move all over the place, and having to do all that extra work, that's going to be a little bit aggravating. It's not going to feel smooth. Matter of fact, there's other things that happen when we're looking at this associations right if I were to touch this it wouldn't be smooth and and feel nice to me it'd be rough and that's going to add meaning to this work of art ah oh, it's a little bit aggravating in that way right um, I might also think that things that are short and jagged and moving around a lot have associations with other things in my life that aren't very pleasing let's say a cardiogram running around or being in a, uh, a car that's vibrating quite a bit and those things also have effects on us, right? The second thing though I wanna say about Giacometti's work is it gets us to our third line, the third type of line. This figure is pointing and any kind of pointing gesture or Anything that moves your eye to, from one place to another is called an implied line. When I point somewhere, your eye is going to go to where I'm pointing. When a sharp 
uh, let's say shape looks like it's pointing somewhere your eye might follow that line to somewhere else when you see lots of dots in a row you will connect those there's not an actual line there we call that the line of sight or an implied line and that's the third type of line so we have an outline a contour line and an implied line right you have actual lines of different qualities just look at these a straight line will have a different kind of feeling than a line that's curvy, than a line that's got sharp angles, than a line that's circular, than a thick line. And then you have different types of implied lines where our eyes connect the dots or move along a line of sight. So let's see if we can find all those lines here in this work by Francisco Goya, the 3rd of May, 1808, by uh, created in 1812, right? So you see the contour lines of the figures. You see the contour lines of the hill, right? Everyone can see those, I hope. And then you see a lot of implied lines. The implied lines of the pointing guns and their bayonets. The implied lines of someone looking back at these figures, right? All of these things direct us around. When we start talking about light, you'll see that these things directing us around are also a component of light. This really bright figure, you're going to look at him, aren't you? He's created as a major player in the story. The final thing that I want to talk about with line is its directionality. When lines feel like they're going up, right, rising up, when your eye is pointed up, it tends to be um, something that feels quite uplifting. When lines are descending where everything feels like it is coming down, that tends to be depressing, and shapes can do this too. So in this case, in this diagram, you see that some lines move us around the bottom up, right? The uplifting of the white figure, who's supposed to, by the way, look like Jesus, and then the descending lines of the dark hill that point us back towards the bad guy shooting us. Now, some more kind of general principles about how lines communicate, what their effect is on us. We call this their quality, right? The quality of line. line there's three different types, but those different types of lines can have all different kinds of qualities that we've been talking about. So in general, vertical lines communicate strength, stability, and authority. Not always, but more often than not, vertical lines have that, that quality. Horizontal lines tend to communicate calm, peace, and passiveness, whereas diagonal lines tend to communicate action, movement, and drama, right? So you see the figure here, it looks like it's in movement, the calmness of the boat, and the uplifting vertical lines. Make sure you write this down and think about this when you see works of art. Again, I'm going to pause here for a minute, and then we'll look at some evidence of this in works of art. Okay, so some more examples of this then. Let's look at this work, for instance. <clears throat> this is a work that is by Henry, Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec, um, famous for his posters in particular, that is just a woman adjusting her stockings. Now, how would you describe the line here? Well, first of all, it's sketchy, isn't it? It's not, it looks like something that was rapidly done. So it gives us a sense of a figure that's in motion. We can see that it's primarily a contour line drawing with just a couple areas of what we'll call modeling or shading later on. So what that quality of line gives us at that level is we're catching some figure in a moment, right? The other part of this is they're long, curving lines, so they're quite pleasing to us, rather than short, jagged, choppy lines. In other words, he's communicating something through the line itself. 
Or you look at this work by Andre Masson called an automatic drawing. And you look at this and it's like, oh, it's really busy, right? It is busy. There's a lot going on. Our eye can't take it in all at once. It was created when Andre Masson put himself in, he was a surrealist. So he put himself into a kind of trance-like state and he just allowed his hand to wander and draw whatever it wanted to, supposedly bring these things out, these images out from his unconscious onto the page. So we look at this and our eyes gonna get moving around and get lost and it's gonna take a lot of work, isn't it? It's gonna really kind of draw us in. We won't get it all at once. And then we'll just maybe start to see little forms, like there's a little animal over here, or there's fingers over here. And in the process of looking at this and imagining what we're seeing, maybe we too get drawn into thinking about unconscious imagery. Now, unlike another drawing that might be created by uh, very short, choppy, jagged lines that are discontinuous. These are all long, smooth, curvy lines that tend to, even though they're much more energetic than a simpler drawing, still be calming. And we see a lot of lines here that are implied lines, right? A lot of these lines, if you follow my cursor, aren't connected. That adds even more energy and more of our work to put that line together. Or we can look at advertising, right? The Nike swoosh. Now you know something about this. Is it a horizontal line? Nope. Is it a vertical line? Nope. Is there a reason that it's on a diagonal? Absolutely. It's about dyn dynamism, movement, energy. Why does it have sharp edges? Because those are all about, you know, they seem kind of uh, strong and they feel like something in motion. Now line occurs again, compositionally as well. Composition, as we'll learn next week, is the way that things are arranged in a work of art. And in this case, the implied lines that are in this work by Titian, called the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, are created by figures looking and figures reaching. So you look at the figures down below, and they reach up or look up towards the figure in the middle, who is the Virgin Mary, who also looks up towards God. And if I were to create a, uh, a kind of diagram of this, it might look like this. So lines are created by these implied lines. It's also lines created in the techniques used by artists. This is a work by Rembrandt van Rijn called The Three Crosses. And it's, a, uh, it's what we call an etching. That's a printing process. And to create a print, what you're basically doing is making little um, in, uh, kind of scratches in the surface of a metal plate or in wax that is then eaten away by acid. And so you can't use the same techniques that you would in painting or in drawing. And the way that you create those tonalities, light and dark, is by what we call hatching, which you'll read about in the book, little long continuous lines, and cross hatching, lines that go across them the other way. Now those kinds of lines tend to have lots of energy in them that you can see here, right? Lots of little tiny lines all over this is something that is quite different than if this was created by a very smooth drawing, right? You look at this up close and it emphasizes maybe something of the emotional quality of the crucifixion. Or this work. Now I'm not going to do this one for you because Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night is going to be the basis of your first summary essay in which you try to put to use what you've learned in your readings and in this lecture to make sense of this work, to identify the different formal elements, talk some about not only what those formal elements are, but what their qualities or effects are. Another type of line is what we call line orientation. This is as if you think about the way that these figures are arranged towards you. And now we get a, another kind of complex term here called the picture plane. This is a work by Jacques-Louis David called The Death of Socrates. Now Socrates died, as some of you know, by committing suicide after being charged with um, corrupting the youth of Athens. And he wasn't given a choice, by the way. They said, you can be exiled or you can commit suicide. And he said, 
I'd rather die for my beliefs than back down from them. And that's what you're seeing here. He's taking the hemlock in his hand and he's pointing his hand up to, I mean, at this time they would have thought heaven. Socrates is really thinking, you know, the area of uh, truth here. Now a picture plane is it's a tricky idea. You want to think that a picture plane is like the surface of the canvas, but it's not exactly that. Imagine that you're looking at this painting as if these are all figures that are existing on a stage. Now, the glass that separates the stage from the audience or the picture from the those who are viewing it, that kind of plane that separates us from them, is called the picture plane. The reason this is important is that we want to be able to say how figures are arranged, how their line is relative to the picture plane. And here he's fully frontal, he's facing us straight on. And this is, by the way, a position of power. When someone's facing you straight on, it's about authority, it's about power, right? Uh, think of the way you interact with other people. When you're talking to other people, you'll notice you'll turn a little bit to the side in deference. Maybe when your parents get mad at you or when you get angry with your kids, you'll face them straight on, right? And that's a position of power. So what we would say is that Socrates here is oriented frontally. The lines are basically parallel to the picture plane, right? And this little grid kind of makes that clear. He is in line with that picture plane. Now let's move on to the formal elements of shape and space, right? Um, shapes we're going to go over pretty quickly. I think they're pretty obvious. So um, shapes, as we'll learn, can be many different types. Let's talk first about positive and negative shapes or space. When you look at this, this picture, usually referred to as the Rubin vase, um, it's tricky. Positive space and negative space usually refers to things this way. If you have a figure, let me back up a little bit here to this, and we look at Socrates, we would say that Socrates is the positive form, and the space around him is the negative space or negative uh, shape or negative form, meaning there's nothing there, there's an absence. When we look at the Reuben vase, if you are seeing a vase right now, the white vase, then the black area is the negative space or the negative shape. If, however, you're seeing two faces looking at each other, then the white is the negative space, right? So negative space means the space not occupied by a form, but in this case, it's an optical illusion, so it kind of shifts back and forth. Another example is this work by Escher again, right? There are certain spaces here, like if you're looking at the goose up at the top, where the white around that goose is the negative space, and the goose is the positive shape or space. But then you get down to the middle of this uh, drawing, and you see that either you're looking at a goose or you're looking at a fish, and they're both positive. And then you get down to the very bottom, and it's the fish that's positive, and the black space around it that's the negative space. Now, this has gone into in the text, and I think it's pretty straightforward, so I won't belabor it. But obviously, we have two major different kinds of shapes, either geometrical shapes, meaning shapes you can identify, right? They look man-made. So if you can give a name to them, like it's a rectangle, it's a square, it's a triangle, it's a circle, it's a trapezoid, those are all geometric shapes. Now, geometric shapes uh, tend to refer to things that are man-made. So if you see a lot of geometric shapes, you're going to think, oh, man-made features, things that refer to an industrial world, things that refer to machines, and so forth. When, however, you see the other type of shape, a organic or biomorphic shape, sometimes called a natural shape, those are shapes such as here, where you don't really have a name for them, right? It's kind of a weird swab. That's an organic shape, and those things tend to refer to natural phenomena. They're irregular. They're not something that uh, you can predict, per se. Now, in addition to that, shapes can either be open or closed. So this is an easy one as well. If it's a bounded shape, like this circle or this shape here, it's a closed shape. If it has an opening in it, it's an open shape. 
Now open shapes tend to take a little bit more work. The area that is open, such as over here, our eye will keep going to that open area. We tend to want to fix things or close them off, right? So open shapes tend to be kind of more ambivalent than closed shapes. They tend to be more open-ended than closed shapes. They tend to kind of draw attention to that opening in a way that a closed shape will not. So examples then. Martin Purier's self from 1978. Is this an organic shape or a geometrical shape? Is it an open shape or a closed shape? Hopefully you're thinking, eh, this is an organic closed form, right? There's no opening in it. Uh, there's no uh, way to give a name to this thing. It tends to look like a natural form. It may even remind us of a human or animal form or something that we found in nature. It will be referential to the natural world more than it will be referential to the industrialized man-made world. Or we look at this work by Barbara Hepworth called Two Figures. Can you identify what is the negative space and what is the positive space here, right? Openings in this and frankly the dug out areas that have all been painted white tend to be read as negative spaces where the wood is a positive space. Or geometrical versus organic. If you look at the circles, they're very geometrical. If you look at the shape of the wood itself, though, it tends to be quite organic. Or this work, also by Barbara Hepworth, called Wave. How does she use organic and geometrical shapes, line, very regular line versus these organic shapes is in an open or closed form. Barbara Hepworth was not really trying to communicate anything in particular. She was creating these beautiful design forms that we would just look at. Maybe they'd refer to something, you know, obliquely like a poem does, like a wave. But on the other hand, they're just meant to be visually interesting forms. And so she puts together all of these contrasts between organic, right, and man-made very linear, in this case, threads or, uh, you know, twine, and then very uh, irregular wood here, and then painted areas and so forth. Shape can also be uh, highly symbolic, such as in this work by a, uh, called the Feast Making Spoon um, uh, from the Dan tribe in Africa. Uh, where you've got, and by the way, these are big, huge spoons, where you've got a anthropomorphized or humaned uh, spoon. And it, this is meant to be referential. Now, you'd only know this is referential, again, if you knew something about the cultural conventions and the way that this was used. It is used in a huge ceremony in which the most um, generous member, woman member of the tribe, who is known as a Vankirli, is, um, is kind of queen for the day. She's the person who gives away all of the excess that she has for the benefit of other members of the tribe. And she carries around this spoon as an offering, right? She is a human kind of feeder or someone who nourishes the tribe. And this is kind of a reference to her. Again, we've got a very representational form both the human legs and the spoon itself. Um, and we've got this kind of negative space of the spoon itself that would be filled with material that is like rice, feeding or nourishing the rest of the tribe. So then let's move on to space. Spatial qualities in works of art, particularly two-dimensional works of art, um, have a lot of terminology that you just have to get under your belt. So I hope you have your lecture guide in front of us and look at the area that's called spatial qualities. And I am going to identify a bunch of those terms here for us now. And then we'll pick them up as we look at some more examples. So again, we have an M.C. Escher work of art, these hands drawing themselves. At this stage, you should be able to, to point out that we've got uh, obviously contour lines here, right? Um, but how is space achieved? This is clearly, it's a two-dimensional piece of paper, so why are we tricked into believing that this is a three-dimensional set of hands? 
Here are some of the terms that you're going to need to know for this. Number one, overlapping. Now it's, a, it's just a piece of paper, right? So when it looks like that pencil is in front of the hand, the reason it looks like it's in front of it is that those lines actually overlap the lines below it. So one way to achieve the illusion of three-dimensionality in a two-dimensional surface of a piece of paper is by overlapping. Number two, and this isn't easy to see in this work of art, it will be easy to see in works of art that have a lot more depth, but things that are further away from us tend to look smaller, don't they? And when an artist does that in a work of art, where things that are up close to us look bigger and things that are further away are made to look smaller, and remember it's all still on a two-dimensional surface, we call that size diminution, size diminution, to diminish the size of things based upon how far they are away from us. Number three, and this is something you all know about, right? Back when you're little and you're trying to draw train tracks going off into the distance, you realize that train tracks, which are actually parallel, as they get further away from us, tend to look like they're converging. So to make lines that are parallel in real life look like they're going off into the distance, we make those lines converge. And we'll pick up some of the other ideas as we go along here right? These are our terms. Overlapping size diminution, converging lines, and another one, modeling or shading. You look at the hands here and you notice that areas that are, some areas are darker around the knuckles, some areas are lighter around the fingers, right? What's happening there is that any object is bathed in light. That's how we see it, right? Light illuminates it. The areas that are closer to the light and are not cast in shadow are highlights. And then as that object gets further away from the light, it very slowly gets darker and darker. And we call that modeling or shading, or as you'll hear later on, chiaroscuro. Now we're going to learn about perspective. Linear one and two point various terms associated with this, such as orthogonals, vanishing point, horizon line. And we're going to learn about some other types of perspectives, such as atmospheric perspective, oblique projection, axonomic projection, and foreshortening. Here's an example of one point perspective. You'll see this in your textbook, and you can always look this up on Google if it doesn't make any sense to you. If you want to draw boxes in one point perspective, this is just a way to make very, very systematic the idea behind converging lines. The way that it works is that this line that you see going across the surface is what we call a horizon line. It's a line by which you see an object. That's the height of your eyes. Now, if you wanted to draw a box up here in the foreground, what you would do is you'd draw the front of that box, but the sides of the box would all recede back to this one, what we call, vanishing point. This is a vanishing point. And all of the lines here, the sides of the box, go back to that vanishing point, right? And you see it over here as well. Here's our horizon line. Here is this vanishing point. Here are these lines coming out and generating the sides of the box. These lines that you see here, they're all imaginary. They're just there to you know, help us to generate this three-dimensional form. And we call these imaginary lines orthogonals, orthogonals. This is what we call linear one-point perspective. And the way that one-point perspective works is that imagine we're trying to represent a box like this where the front is directly parallel to our picture plane or is perfectly facing us. If this box, however, is tilted this way so that we have a leading edge or a corner towards us, we need to use a different technique that is called linear two-point perspective. In linear two-point perspective, you have the same terms. In the middle here, we have a horizon line, but because those box are tilted so that their leading edge is facing us, we need to use two vanishing points, one on each side to generate each side of the box. Now there's no use in me really explaining these further. What I'd like you to do is maybe pause the video at this point and try to draw a box in linear one point perspective and try to draw a box using this diagram or looking something up in your book or frankly on Google 
in two-point perspective until you figure out how to do this. A lot of work of art, especially from the Renaissance, so about the four, early 1400s forward, use linear perspective. Here we see linear perspective used, but it's not uniform. It doesn't have one horizon line. You can see these beams in the ceiling. If you follow them down, they're all going to recede back here. Whereas these lines to the top of these door jams recede back here. And if I show you a diagram, you can see how this works, right? It's using linear perspective. It just doesn't have one vanishing point. By the time we get to people like Leonardo da Vinci, in his famous work, The Last Supper, he will be using very, very systematically linear one-point perspective to represent this space. So the tops of all these tapestries up here, this top of the ceiling, this coffering of the ceiling, all recede back to one vanishing point. And here's a diagram to show you this, right? That's linear one-point perspective. Now the cool thing about linear one-point perspective is that it generates a really illusionistic art form. So when you see this in the space that it was created for, it almost looks like Jesus in the Last Supper is at the end of the room just having dinner there, as if the room just keeps going on off into the distance. So let's go back to this again and add a few more terms to this. Things that are close to us, we call that the foreground. The immediate area right behind things that are in the foreground we call the middle ground and things that are way behind that we call the background, right? When things are st standing on a ground plane, we call that the ground plane, right? So a for instance here, can you see the different types of perspective that have been used in this, art, uh, in this work of art? The ground plane is what they're standing on, right? Where are the vanishing points? If we look at this building here, you can probably see that it recedes off into the distance and there's a vanishing point over here and a vanishing point over here for it. And then you see the sidewalk, how it recedes off into the distance. There's a vanishing point back here. So the artist is using both two and one point perspective here. And here's a diagram to show you that. Now let's go back to this and add a couple more terms to this. A big way to generate the illusion of three dimensions in a work of art is to use what we call atmospheric perspective. You've probably observed this if you grew up in Seattle and you look out over the water, you see the hills off on the islands there. Things that are closer to us have a lot more color and a lot more detail than things that are further away. And the reason for that is that there's more atmosphere between you and things that are further away that dulls colors and reduces detail. We call that effect atmospheric perspective. And when an artist creates a work of art in which everything up close is in hyper detail and then the further away we get, things get less detail and then they turn all gray, that's employing atmospheric perspective. Now this is a really good work of art. It's called Paris Rainy Day by Gustav Kaivat to practice all of our different, at this stage, everything we've learned about creating the illusion of three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface. We've already talked about the use of linear one-point perspective and the use of linear two-point perspective. We just talked about atmospheric perspective. Can you see the use of size diminution? These figures up close are much bigger than the figures that are further away. Now here's the thing, they're not really further away, are they? They're painted on the exact same surface. This canvas is all a flat surface, so he's painted these figures smaller so that our eye thinks that they're further away. When this woman's arm disappears behind his arm, really they're on the same surface, so the artist is using the technique of overlapping so as to make us feel like this part of the arm is in front of this part of the arm right? Now, we won't use this in this class, but you should be aware that, um, you know, various different traditions of art weren't very interested in creating illusions of three-dimensionality. They were just trying to create the idea of space um, so that you could see lots of information. This happens particularly in Asian forms of art. In this case, you're looking at a kind of perspective that's called oblique projection. 
In this case, it's a work of art that is called the Kamano Mandala, in which you see these different spiritual compounds. They're all exactly the same. And yes, we have a little bit of size diminution, right? This one's bigger, a little bit smaller, really small. But he's not using linear one point perspective. He's just making everything into this kind of parallelogram. And that's what is called uh, oblique projection. And we don't use this as well, but in architecture all the time, Architects use a technique called axonomic projection in which they explode form. It's all seen from up above, such as in this work by Theo van Doesburg called color construction. You don't need to remember those. You do need to remember this, though. The technique by which we achieve perspective and create the illusion of three-dimensionality, which you see here in a work by, this is just a drawing by Albrecht Durer, who will be an artist we look at in this class, called a draftsman drawing a reclining nude, um, can also be used to do what we call foreshorten a figure. Now imagine I ask you to draw this, right? And it's facing this way. It's going to be, let's say, fairly easy. But what if I point it towards you? How are you going to draw it now? And the way to draw that is using a technique that's called foreshortening, which we see here in the work by Andrea Mantegna, The Dead Christ. Foreshortening makes everything shorter because as things point towards you, in order to get that accurate, you have to shorten them. That's called foreshortening. So we have a number of different techniques that are used to create the illusion of three dimensions here, don't we? Now, I also want to point to a couple of other things that are not really a part of creating space, but playing around with space. Everything we've looked at so far presumes you're standing in one spot looking at an object, basically if you're standing and looking at an object. But artists can mess with you. They can change your viewpoint onto things. They could put your viewpoint way down low or way up high or way off to the side or do things like this. Take a minute to look at this work by Umbo, who is a surrealist photographer called Weird Street. See how long it takes you to figure out what's going on here. It looks like an abstract form, but then you start to see, wait a minute, that looks like a figure, but what am I looking at? Well, what Umbo did is really late in the afternoon when shadows were being cast very long, he took a photograph of a street scene from above it. So what you're actually looking at here is a cart and this is the man. You're looking at him as if you're hovering up above him. And so the negative form of his shadow becomes a positive form of what looks like a strange figure. Or George O'Keefe's work here called Pelvis with Shadows and Moon from 1943, right? In this case, the artist has put your head way down low as if you're looking through a skeletal form, a skeleton of a pelvis up at the moon. And we have this nice play of light and dark and again, geometrical forms of the moon up above with the abstract uh, or fairly abstract forms of the pelvis down below to create this beautiful pleasing, really decorative form. Okay, so let's finish up here talking about light and then color and then a little bit about texture, pattern, time, and movement. This is a work by Leonardo da Vinci called Madonna of the Rocks. Um, it's a work that's, again, we're not talking about the subject matter here. The subject matter is the Virgin Mary in the center with John the Baptist under the Virgin Mary's right hand and Jesus down blessing him along with the angel Uriel. What I really want to talk about here is the use of light. Obviously, everything in a work of art, um, you know, uses light. Well, the way we think about light here is in terms of value, right? So light and dark is what we call a value. When things are darker, we call, as you see here in this grayscale, those darker types of, in this case, gray. We call that a tone. And as they get lighter, we call it a tint, right? And the same thing can occur in color. Color, of course, in this color of light blue can be lighter or darker tones or tints of that blue. The way that light and dark usually shows up in representational paintings is according to how much light we think 
there is that is touching the surface of an object. And this is what we call modeling or shading or chiaroscuro, which I referred to before when we were looking at the Escher hand. In this case, we've got a really good example, a sphere. Now, the closest area to the light source, let's say the sun or a, uh, a light bulb, is this area that we call the highlight here, right? It is the lightest area. That's the closest to the light source. And then you see progressively, it goes from tints all the way through the value scale of light and dark to tones of dark. The area that's furthest away from the light source is the darkest area of this sphere, right? That's the way that we create an illusion of three dimensions. This is clearly a flat area, right? It's not a real sphere. It's a flat screen or it is uh, you know, a piece of paper that the artist has tricked us into believing is 3D by making one area light and then progressively it's going towards dark. And we call this modeling or shading or the Italians call it chiaroscuro, which literally means light and dark. So when Leonardo da Vinci paints these faces, the area closest to the light source here is lighter and the area furthest away on this side of her face gets darker. That's the use of light and dark or modeling or shading. Now, light can also be used to make us think about atmosphere as we see in this work by J.M.W. Turner called Rain, Steam, and Speed. In this case, the artist has used a lot of techniques that we've seen. He's used converging lines for the railway tracks, but everything else seems like a mist. And that's because what he's trying to get at is the feeling of a very kind of um, smoky, misty afternoon. So the artist has messed around with light and dark to give us that feeling. Light can also be used not very accurately in order to instill a mood. So we see this very high contrast, right? Contrast is the difference between light and dark in a work by Artemisia Gentileschi called Judith and Holofernes, or Judith and the Maid Servant and Holofernes, where we have a candlelight that really, really creates a high contrast. And this high contrast is usually referred to as either high contrast or tenebrism, or frankly, Caravaggism, because the famous artist Caravaggio used this technique to instill a lot of drama or theatricality in his works all of the time. Right, another work. We'll see more of Artemisia Gentileschi's work, by the way, when we get to the Baroque period. This is Judith and her maidservant cutting off the head and saving the day of Holofernes. Light and dark can also be used not just to create the illusion of three dimensionality, but also to be symbolic. And I just wanted to point this out. Not all works of art are just about using light and dark to create illusions. In this work by Nikolai Vuglov, uh, we see a work, by the way, that's called Racing Sideways, that is about race relations. It's got this weird transition between light and dark, where on the left hand side of the screen we have what appear to be white athletes running. And then on the far right hand side of the scene, everything's inverted. So it looks like black athletes. And of course, they're all running at the same pace. And it's meant to make us think about race in the world, race, both in terms of race and athletics, but also race include, uh, meaning racism and whether, you know, people are being held back by their race or being put ahead by their race. I also want to say this, you know, sometimes we see works of art where the color looks very kind of muted, as you see in this comparison between um, Michelangelo's creation of man on the top before the work was cleaned and then down at the bottom after the work is cleaned. Obviously, when you see works of art that are in high color and darkened conditions, they look muted, but they also can look muted because over time, Lots of dirt gets on them, soot and, uh, you know, oil lamps and candle soot get on these and darken them up. And then we clean them off and they get very vibrant and light. Now color, color's an interesting one, right? When we are seeing the color kind of clear color or white light, what we're actually seeing are all different 
um, spectrums of the visible light that we see. So white light is made up of violet and blue and green and yellow and orange and red all together, which we only see separated when they're separated by a prism. That's the way that light works. When you see clear light, you're actually seeing all spectrums of the visible uh, spectrums of light. So when you mix together all of the different colors in light, you get white. But when you mix together all of the colors of pigment, of course, you get a kind of brownish color. And we're going to talk about how you create color with pigments using a color wheel. So our terms here, most of you know this already, but colors are divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. Further, arrangements of colors can be called complementary complementary or analogous, and I'll explain this in a moment, and colors can be further divided into what we call warm versus cool colors. Now, all of these different complementary or analogous colors or warm versus cool colors have different effects on us. So again, most of you know this, the primary colors that artists use are red, blue, and yellow. Those are the primaries. So when you mix together yellow, blue, or red, like let's say you mix together yellow and red, you will get a secondary color called orange. If you mix together yellow and blue, you get green. If you mix together, of course, blue and red, you get purple or violet. Those are secondary colors. Um, when you start talking about tertiary colors, which we won't use in this class very often, like red, violet, and so forth, you know, you're at the mixing together of uh, purple and red and so forth. Easy enough, right? Nothing to really say about that other than those are terms you want to have under your belt. Are we talking about red, blue, and yellow primaries? Or are we talking about secondary colors? More important is the idea of what happens when you use a really, really vibrant color. So a really, really vibrant yellow with a lot of white in it is what we call saturated. It has a lot of intensity. Those are two key terms here. Intensity or saturation means the amount of yellow or the amount of a color that is being used. So something that looks really, really popping yellow, we'll call that, oh, that's an intense yellow or that's a really saturated yellow or red or whatever it might be. Yeah. If they're muted, we just say that's a muted, uh, you know, use of yellow. It's got more usually black in it than white. Another important idea is that colors that are directly or even partially across from each other on a color wheel are what we call complementary. Complementary colors intensify each other. So when you put together a yellow against a purple, yellow will look even more intense and saturated, as will purple. And it's a function of the wavelengths of the colors, actually. They actually really look more intense to us. So if you want to create a work of art that is about intensity, is about action, is about emotion, you'll put complementary colors next to each other. Blue next to orange, red next to green, yellow next to purple, right? Or even, frankly, yellow next to red and yellow next to blue, which are partially complementary to intensify each other. Think of the way that sports teams oftentimes use complementary colors to emphasize action and power. Yeah. Colors that are on the yellow through the red end of the spectrum, we call warm colors. And colors that are on the green through the purple end of the spectrum, we call cool colors. And they also have effects. The warm colors tend, tend to feel like they are standing out and advancing towards us. It's one of the reasons we use reds and yellows on warning signs, right? They pop out. They tend to feel like they're expanding. Colors on the cool end of the spectrum do the opposite. They feel like they're receding away from us and they feel like they're contracting. So let's say you want to create a picture that's all about like um, being really generous and open and happy and outgoing. You're going to use warm colors. If you want to make a picture that's about depression or introversion, you'll probably use cool colors that feel like they're contracting and receding. Now, let's think about the representational versus symbolic uses of color. And this is kind of easy. When a color is the same color as the thing it's meant to represent in real life, let's say a red apple and the artist uses red, we say he's using or she's using 
local color. Local color just means the color of something as it should be seen in real time. Let's say the artist though is using local colors, but they're representing an apple, but we're seeing the apple in the darkness, so the apple is much muted. That's still accurate. It's still a local color, but we would call that perceptual use of color, emphasizing the conditions under which we are seeing a particular object. And I'm going to show you an example of this. Here we have a haystack, right? And some of you probably know that the famous artist Claude Monet represented haystacks over and over again in different types of light during different times of the day. So on the left, you see a photograph of a haystack, and on the right, you see a painting of a haystack, the way it looked to him in this particular light conditions. And we would call that the perceptual use of color, right? It's representational, meaning that's how it looked to him at various times of day, at various times of the year. Same haystack, or roughly the same haystack, but bathed in different atmospheric conditions and thus looking differently. Or his paintings of Rouen Cathedral. Same cathedral at different times of day, different light conditions, looking quite different, isn't it? And we call that the perceptual use of color. He's trying to paint it accurately, but it looks different at different times of the day and different times of the year, thus perceptual use of color. When an artist changes the local color, meaning in this case, Vincent van Gogh's The Night Cafe, to use different types of color that probably weren't in the cafe, we either call this expressive color or symbolic color, right? Van Gogh clearly wasn't trying to paint this accurately. He didn't want to paint the way that the cafe looked for you. He wanted to paint the way that the cafe felt to him, right? And to him, the cafe felt really terrifying. He didn't like it. He wasn't very good at, at being social. And so, for instance, if you were to look at this and say, okay, what colors are being used? Well, we're using kind of complementary colors, reds against greens against yellows. They're going to clash and clang together and energize each other and make us feel uncomfortable in this space. You can take that further and look at the space in the room. Look at the linear perspective that's used for the floorboards. It doesn't look right, does it? It lo doesn't look accurate. It looks like everything's tilting down away from us. That's made to make us feel uncomfortable. Look at the shadow of the billiard board or the way that the chair gets in our way if we were to walk into this room. It doesn't feel inviting, does it? He's doing all of that in order to express the idea of how this cafe makes us feel. Using complementary colors along the way, they're not local, meaning they don't look accurate to the way that they should look. He's changed them. And whenever an artist paints something in a way in which you're looking at it, let's say an apple instead of being green or red or even yellowish, suddenly it's like purple. You have to think, why did the artist do that? Or you look at Vincent van Gogh's bedroom in Arles here, right? It's totally different, isn't it? The feeling of the use of colors is primarily these colors are what we call analogous colors. Analogous colors are colors that are right next to each other on a color wheel and those types of colors harmonize with one another. They soothe us. Here we've got very, very earth tone colors all close to each other on a color wheel. In his bedroom, it makes him feel comfortable. The only areas that are warmish colors are the bed, meaning something that is warm and comfortable to him, right? That's what we call expressive use of color or symbolic use of color, meant to not just represent the way that something looks, but represent an idea that the artist wants to convey to us. Some colors, which we may or may not get to in this class, are totally symbolic, such as this work by Vasily Kandinsky called Composition Number no. 2, in which in this work he was using color in other uh, order to symbolize um, an apocalyptic scene on the left-hand side and a utopian scene on the right-hand side. In this case, this doesn't look like any world you've ever seen. It's quite very abstract, although it still has some representational form in it. And, you know, because it's not very accurate to a world we've ever seen, we'd want to know what is the artist thinking these colors are meant to mean. 
Artists play around with color too in terms of their technique. Um, you will read about Chuck Close's work here. This is his self-portrait. The work in your text is a little bit different work, but it's the same technique where Chuck Close sets little games for himself in order to create works of art that look from afar very realistic, but when you look at them up close, they're these weird little color separations. And in a way, Chuck Close is working from a long tradition. This is a famous work by Georges Seurat called Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jatte uh, that uses the technique of pointillism. Pointillism is creating a painting, in this case, of little dots of color that then when the eye sees them next to each other, blend in the eye. So you're creating a work that if you were to look at this up close, looks like this. But when you look at it from far away, suddenly it becomes a fairly realistic scene. And Chuck Close is doing the same thing. Finally, I want to talk some about time, texture, emotion. Texture is a no-brainer. I don't think I have to talk about it much here, right? Something that's smooth is going to be more pleasing. Something that's rough is going to have a different kind of feeling. Texture can be both literal texture, like a sculpture can be rough or smooth, but it can also be something that is uh, visual. You can look at a painting and it looks like it's very rough and that's going to have a different effect on you. Time and motion are different things. You're looking at work here by Gian Lorenzo Bernini called David. And in this case, David was the, this is before he becomes king of Israel. He's a young boy who slays this powerful giant Goliath. And we'll hear about him later in the quarter. In this work, you can see him implying motion, right? He's getting ready to take this sling back and throw the stone that will fall this, this huge giant. And, and later on, he'll run up and cut his head off here. It implies motion by the stance of the figure, right? So think of this work of David next to Michelangelo's David. Which one has more motion? Which one implies more motion? Can you ever even imagine Michelangelo's David on the right doing anything else? By the way, if you're wondering about what idealism really is applied to when we were talking about representational art forms, Michelangelo's David idealizes the male form, right? But he looks static. He doesn't look like he's in motion. This is meant to be contemplative, to think about things, to admire his beauty. Whereas Gian Lorenzo Bernini's David looks like a figure that's really working hard at what he's doing. It's about human effort. It's about dynamism. It's about the theater and drama of this key moment. And it looks that way from all sides, right? Another way that motion can be used in works of art, though, is by thinking about how we see works of art. So in this case, this is a work of art by Bernini again called Apollo and Daphne. And the story here is a Greek myth. And, and you know, I guess the way to frame this is that Apollo is the god of beauty and poetry and, and the sun. And in Greek mythology, the gods represent certain aspects of humanity. And Apollo is a good guy. He almost never does anything wrong. But in this case, Cupid shoots him with an arrow that inflames his lust for the young virginal um, goddess of the woods, Daphne, and then sits back and walks, watches as Apollo tries to catch her, where she has, n she has no interest in him at all. So the whole story, by the way, is about this chase. Now, how do you, in a sculptural form, marble, that can't move, create a narrative about Chase. And the way the artist did this is by setting up his composition in such a way that as you, as the viewer, move around it, your own motion unfolds the scene. When you first see this, as you would this way, from behind, you just see a guy running. You can't even see what he's running after necessarily. But as you progressively move around the sculpture to the side, you see what he's chasing this woman. And the space in between them seems to get closer and closer the more you move around it, right? He's catching up to her. And then you get a little bit further and suddenly he's caught her. It looks like that space has collapsed entirely. You see his hand on the other side of her over here, right? And by the way, if you're wondering what's happening to her at the last moment, right as Apollo catches her, 
her father saves her by turning her into a laurel tree, which is what's happening now. So the artist is implying movement by using your movement around the work of art so as to change what you actually see. And movement, of course, can be created just perceptually, and we'll end here. This is a work by Kenneth Nolan called About. If you stare at this for a while, you're never gonna forgive me because you're just gonna keep seeing concentric rings and they keep kind of moving, right? It's an optical illusion. Obviously the work isn't moving, but the more you stare at it, the more it will appear to be moving. And that's even more the case with Bridget Riley's work called Drift Number Two. Creating the optical illusion of movement will make you feel like you're in movement. And that's quite a different effect than what would happen if you were looking at th something that was completely stationary. Now, what I want you to do is start to feel comfortable with thinking about these formal elements and their effects on you. And the best way to do that is to really observe and reflect upon what your experience of these works of art are, right? Early on in the game, test things out. There are no hard and fast rules to this, right? So I don't think anyone would look at this work, for instance, and say, oh, it looks really static. I don't see anything in movement, right? So trust yourself a little bit when you're doing the assignments for this week. And let me know if you have any questions. So until next week, I'll see you then.